have you ever found an American chestnut? While most people have heard the story of these giants of the past who were wiped out by an invasive blight, what you might not know is that there's still a lot of American chestnut around. Whether you're in your woods or hiking around on a trail, you might be passing these trees, or at least smaller versions of them, and not even know it. Today we're going to learn a little bit about the process of hunting for American chestnut and reporting those trees if you do happen to find them. We're going to go out in the woods with two very experienced chestnutters who have lots of reports. In fact, the number one chestnut finder on the Tree Snap app. Hi, I'm Ken Dardanell, president of the Kentucky Chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. We're here today to talk in, about American chestnuts and we're here to focus on tree snap and the use of tree snap in uh, uh, the searching process to find the trees, then the data entry to track and map the trees. And I'm Jimmy Sizemore, I'm here again with, with, uh, with Ken and, and Ellen in the Red River Gorge. I'm also a member of the uh, Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, also the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. And I know we're going to talk a lot about tree snap today. Uh, tree snap is a, is a tool that I use and, and when I'm out, at, out in the woods I use it a lot for American chestnuts but also some other, uh, other species as well and I think it's a very valuable tool. Ken, so we're here talking about tree snap. We both use it, understand what a great tool it is, but by far you are the tree snap expert, especially when it comes to the American chestnut. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your experience with tree snap. Why did you use it and, and, and how, how does it fit in with what you normally do? Yeah, so, so good question and that's a long story. It's so, so the past three and a half years I've been using tree snap pretty much since tree snap came out and was introduced to us. We're going out to find, to cover as much ground as we can, that's usually via trails and we're going out to find as many wild American chestnut trees as we can. So, so it's, it's work, but it's also a lot of fun because, because the plus is I have seen parts of Kentucky. I've been on trails. I've been on cliff tops. I've been on side paths. I've crawled under laurel in places, climbed up cliff crevices, places that I never would have gone otherwise if you're just doing your typ typical, you know, occasional hike. So, so the value of it um, for the work part is to, is to search for trees and, and find, well, kind of two parts, to find where they do grow and to find where they do not grow. So your searching process kind of tells you both. As you're hiking the trails, for example, here we're, we're in beautiful Red River Gorge, which has been the central focus of the, I think, what is it, 40,000 acres or so of Red River Gorge, which is a part of the 708,000 acres of Daniel Boone National Forest, there's a lot of places to go. So hiking the trails allows you to do two things. It allows you to cover a lot of ground to search, and if you select the trails that follow the ridge tops where American chestnuts tend to grow, then you're, you're putting yourself where you might find trees, but also part of that is where you don't find trees, that leaves a hole in the map that you plot to tell us that trees don't grow, like along the creek beds, for example, they tend not to grow. The other part of searching for American chestnuts is the fact that it's a lot of fun for exercise. You know, I'm retired now after a long career as a plant manager in a wood business. If I'm home, I'm uh, drinking coffee on the computer and nibbling on snacks and things, and, and I've got to have something to get me out and burn some calories and keep in shape. And uh, while well, I still have a lot of energy left, I want to cover as much uh, ground as possible. You mentioned hiking. That, that word keeps coming up. And, you know, that's the way that you typically would use it. You know, me too. You know, I, uh, I'm out hiking, and I just happen to see, see a chestnut, you know. And, of course, you know, we've got our handy phone. And we don't even have, we don't even have to have, have service. And we can use that phone to do something that's really important while we're out there just having a blast anyway. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you mentioned that I think is, you know, I've, I've done it myself, you know. I, I maybe, maybe I want to know if there are chestnuts in this particular area. I've looked at a deed, or my father or someone has told me, you know, I remember chestnuts, and so I go back to just see. Now, that's, that's where I'm actually intentionally going to an area looking for something. And you've certainly done, done a lot of that. But also, you know, you've done it just 
just while you were out hiking anyway in areas that you that you just wanted to visit. It, it gives you a, a, an incentive, if you would, to go some places, maybe, and hike some trails that you've never hiked before. But mm -hmm. also, you know, it, it's just you, you've got the tool right here with you when you're out just, you know, maybe you don't have an intent of actually finding a tree that day. I know I have found a lot like that where I'm just walking along with some people and I say, hey, that's an American chestnut. The important part, the, the, and the more you search, the more you study the topography of Kentucky, because chestnut trees grew from east to west, from, from, uh, the, from the West Virginia border to um, LBL, land between the lakes, in the southern region. Chestnuts did not grow, and still do not grow well, in the uh, bluegrass section of the state. It's limestone and sweet soil. The chestnuts wanted to find, want to have sandstone soil generally a thousand feet and higher but we find them also at six and eight hundred feet as you kind of go toward the west um, so so part of the fun of it is you now start searching things maps like all trail even your tree snap uh, the on your computer you can navigate on the map to see and zoom in and zoom out it shows a contour map for example to show you the better places to hunt for American chestnuts. So the search process, once you've kind of covered an area, then you want to branch out and find some other places or guide some other people to search. Yeah, you start looking at all the trails, you know, especially the public lands across Kentucky. Right. And in Kentucky, we're blessed with a lot of public land. Part of the fun is uh, to get out the, the fun of the hunt. You know, if you're a collector, I'm a collector by nature, collect certain things. But the fun of the hunt, the search, is, is really cool. Um, again, when you might cover a trail and go a good distance, and you're going, gee, there ought to be a chestnut tree here. You're just not finding them. You try to go over the points, the rock cliffs, and look down. And finally, you will get into an area that has several chestnut trees. That's good. Then the main thing we're searching for out there is trying to find larger trees. we got a larger right. tree we're going to look at here in a second. But we're really looking for quantities of trees to help us in Kentucky, to help our scientists understand where they grow, and of course, obviously, where they grew in the past. Um, but we're also looking especially for larger trees that can bloom. Uh, American chestnut trees bloom mid to late uh, June every year, well after the frost, which is good, uh, prevents uh, uh, frost damage to their flowers and nuts. So we're looking for those larger trees to use in our breeding program. Uh, the American chestnut trees in the wild, they're so scattered and so few. I mean, a, a tree, what we call a large American chestnut tree now, is at least three or three and a half inches to, to ten inches. To find an American chestnut tree past ten inches in diameter before the blight kills it is really rare. Really, really rare. Uh, even to find one seven inches and, to, and, and bigger diameter breast height, diameter breast height, is really rare. So when we find those few trees, they're not close enough to pollinate each other. So we'll find a tree here. So for example, from where we're standing, there's a tree right here along the road. Then we have trees on the far ridge. We have tree, trees four miles out this way that, that I have found through the tree snap process and hiking. Then we come back and check them to find out which ones are flowering. We have to time it to the maximum ripeness of those flowers to gather pollen from one tree carry it, you know, process, there's some processing, carry it to another tree, like the tree right here, to, to uh, pollinate by humans, because they're too far apart for the insects or winds uh, to pollinate. So we're definitely looking for a number of trees, but especially for the larger chestnut trees. So if any of um, um, the more hikers we have, and we're going to talk about that more uh, here, here shortly, but especially if somebody finds a larger chestnut tree, you know, four inches and larger, let us know, because uh, we sure want to come and see that tree so we can use it in our breeding program. You know, Ken, you, you, you really hit on something extremely important there when you're looking for these trees, you know, so that you could, could possibly use the, use the app. You know, at one time, you know, this, this tree was extremely common. You know, you hear all this stuff, you know, one in four trees. The reality, four billion trees. Now we know from some of the recent research that we've got about 1% of that. We've got maybe 438 million trees, but most of those, most of those <clears throat> trees have, have a diameter of less than one inch. 
And so, you know, but what you're going to do is most of the time when you're walking along, that's about, that's about, you know, you're going to, these things are going to be at eye level. They're not going to be very big. If you find one of those small ones, though, the likelihood of looking up and seeing a larger one, well, mm -hmm. you know, it's that your chances have really increased right there. And so, again, you know, having that, having that phone out, being aware of how to use that, you know, walking along and you're taking pictures and you're hiking, you're enjoying it all. Once you, you see something that, wow, that's an American chestnut. I wonder if there are any others. There's kind of two parts to finding a tree that can flower. So number one, you're going to find a lot of trees under the canopy in the shade. And those are going to be the smaller trees for sure. Because American chestnuts can, can um, kind of hang on, grow very slowly under the canopy. But chestnut trees grow best in the sunlight. So, so yeah, so, so I'm on a search to find an area, you, you said it very well, where are there chestnuts? Then I start looking for, plot a few of those of course, then I start looking for where is there sunlight, where is there an opening? So for example here, we're right along uh, the gravel Tunnel Ridge Road, just so happens to be a nice chestnut tree right over here that is flowered, we've collected pollen from the past three years. But the main thing to find the larger trees is to find um, a sunlight opening. That could be where some trees have fallen in the forest. Chestnuts, if, the, if you have a sprout there, it'll shoot up. But I spend a lot of time going out on the cliff edges. Uh, I don't get too close, my feet start tingling. So, uh, but I get close enough, hang on a tree to, you know, some of the cliffs are sheer, but a lot of the cliffs are kind of benches and um, have chestnut trees growing there. So when you have the cliffs, you have a chance of the sunlight getting to the trees and a better chance of finding the larger trees that can bloom. So that's part of, again, how to hunt. You can find quantities in, under the canopy, but we tend to find our larger trees where there's a sunlight opening. And uh, the other point you made is very good. There's just not that many survivors, but there are more survivors than the average person thinks. When I run right. across somebody on the trails, we start talking about chestnuts. What are you doing kind of question. I'll say I'm hunting American chestnuts. Oh, I thought they were extinct. Well, functionally they are in terms of they can't, they, they do very little pollinating to breed by seeds. But fortunately that chestnut blight does not live in the soil. And that lets the roots of the chestnuts continue to grow from the previous trees that have died. Then American chestnuts are coppice sprouters in the buds at the root collar. So chestnut trees are very good sprouters to send up new shoots. All right, so uh, let's talk about a little bit more about the details of the process to chestnut hike and, and search. Again, if you're just kind of going for a little circle, uh, that's one thing. If you're going for a full day hike, some of my hikes have been, I think the longest hike was 12 miles. That was a pretty good hike, including all the side little trips, looking over the cliff points and that sort of thing. So you got to be prepared. For sure, take a backpack because you want to carry water, uh, some snacks or lunch, depending on your timing of coming and going to your car. Um, always wear snake and tick guards that I spray with um, tick spray. Carry a spare battery because when you're out there, again, if you're out for a full day on a trail, you can use up a battery uh, pretty quickly. It's good to have a spare. Of course, take your American Chestnut Foundation hat. They're available at www.acf.org. Uh, for sure, you want to take um, uh, tick repellent and you want to take uh, gnat repellent because those little suckers uh, uh, can be a nuisance in your eyes and ears. If I'm going out in a, a rough area, especially getting off the trails, because chestnuts don't grow just right along the trails, uh, I take bear spray if I'm by myself because I'm not making noise to alert the bears, or sometimes I'll beat my sticks on a tree or something to alert them I'm coming through a thick spot. But you don't want to get between a mother bear and her cubs kind of early in the year. So I carry that just in case. The other thing you want to carry is a little bit of string, um, a ruler, because one of the things uh, you need to enter in your observations is the diameter at four and a half feet, which is called DBH, diameter breast height. Um, we don't have to have an exact measurement. Uh, so you can either use a ruler, you just got to line up to get the outside edges of that circumference of the tree. Or if you want something more accurate to measure, you can make you can put a string around the tree, get your length. Then you, with your tape measure, I carry a soft tape measure as well. Uh, you can measure the tree from that 
is an easy way to do it, or you can carry a circumference tape. Uh, really important, uh, whatever you do, if you go chestnut hunting, take a pair of binoculars. Not the self-focusing kind, I have a pair of those, but the kind you can focus in and out. Because when you're on the trails, especially, the trails are pretty easy to walk, but a lot of places are very rocky, thick mountain laurel, thick uh, rhododendron perhaps, maybe it's down over the cliff. You want to be able to look out and check out that tree. And we'll talk when we go to our tree in a minute how to see chestnut leaves, wild American chestnut leaves. But having this look down through the brush or out some distance saves you a lot of step and uh, steps and sometimes saves you from having to climb down, you know, over the edge of a cliff to uh, get to a tree. And then, like Jimmy has really made the good point, always have that. Some place you're not going to lose it. I did lose my phone once, temporarily, because I have a habit of tapping my back pocket as I'm going out these trails. Tap my back pocket one time, where's my phone? Well, I had stopped to eat lunch and laid it down. <laughs> Got up, packed everything up except my phone. Anyway, I had to hike a mile back to find it. Fortunately, still laying there. But yeah, you want to keep that phone someplace secure. So Ken, here we are. A nice, large American chestnut. Large, again, like you said, kind of a relative term. But we're right here. We're kind of in the shade, but we're in the shade of this American chestnut. It's growing right here beside a road. Notice the dead tree next to it. Likely that tree died, and when it did, this chestnut took advantage and shot up. So you found this tree about, what, about three years ago? That's right. Oh, as a matter of fact, the Forest Service pointed out to us, the U.S. Forest Service had found this tree in one of their FIA random plots and told, uh, told the chapter we came to it and found it. So three years ago it was three inches DBH, or maybe just shy. It's currently a little bit past three and a half inches DBH measured. Uh, it's about 26 feet tall. So here's a good place to talk in terms of how to do an observation. Uh, so again, the first thing we do once we find a tree, and once we identify for sure and confirm it's American chestnut, then we can uh, have right in my back pocket, just happen to have my uh, phone app, then you would pull open your tree snap app. Right. And we're not gonna be able to show this on, on camera exactly, but you choose from the various species in our case, we're always going to choose American chestnut to enter the data. So then there's a real easy menu here, very user friendly. As soon as you do one or two trees, you're fully practiced. So it's going to ask for pictures. Um, we'll take, well, I, I try to take at least three pictures of every tree. The more interesting the tree is, I might take another two or three. So for example, if it's a tree we might use in our breeding, because it's a larger tree, it has some sunlight, I might take four or five pictures. If it's a tree, you know, kind of a smaller tree and I'm seeing several in the area, I might just take two. But the most important thing is to confirm it's chestnut, because again, there's things out in the woods that look like American chestnut. Right. Beech looks like American chestnut. Uh, Sawtooth oaks, normally those are planted in parks, those look like American chestnut. So do be careful. Chinese chestnuts, we don't want a tree snap Chinese chestnuts. We don't want them. <laughs> you know, you're going to see those if you find a tree in somebody's backyard, a park, um, uh, some public planning, uh, cemetery, it's going to be almost always Chinese chestnut. So you want to again learn how to identify the American. Then we're going to take a picture um, of the top of the leaf plus the end of the, the uh, twig. So by looking at the top of the leaf and the end of that twig with the buds, we can confirm if it's American or uh, Chinese or obviously if it's something else. Then it's always helpful to us to take a picture of the bottom of the leaves because American chestnuts do not have very many uh, stellate hairs on the bottom. Chinese chestnuts do. So by taking those pictures, um, anybody who has interest, a scientist, somebody from the chapter, somebody trying to confirm your tree can pull up your pictures on the site. We can tell real quick if it's American chestnut or not. Once that's complete, then it just asks questions. Does it have nuts or burrs present? Does it have catkins present? Of course, that'd be in the middle of the summer to have catkins potentially. Does it have chestnut blight? Yes or no. Then it's got uh, a couple of descriptions to enter. I hate to say it, we just found out that our tree here has just just developed this summer blight at the very base of the tree. Uh, I've been watching this tree for three years. It's been amazing how smooth the bark has been and not allowed it to crack open to let that chestnut blight get in. But now the tree's a little bit larger the bark starts to fissure a little bit. That's a perfect opening for the chestnut blight. 
So our tree is now doomed. That blight will spread around this particular tree. It probably has one more year. And then the blight will girdle the tree and kill it. We may come back in mud pack and trying to slow that down a little bit. But um, we won't be able to save this tree much longer. Next question that you will enter is, uh, is it a planted or wild tree? Well, we know it's a wild tree here. How's the canopy health? Again, there's some categories to enter. Tree diameter. Now, for our citizen science purposes, you can estimate, but always estimate at four and a half feet above the soil level. And once you measure a time or two or pick a place on your body that's four and a half feet, that helps. If everybody made, enters the diameter at the very base at the tree swell, they will overstate the size of the tree. That will confuse our scientists in terms of how big that tree really is. So that's always a four and a half feet. Now you can estimate it a little, just practice a little bit with a ruler. I always carry a small ruler. So you can, with a little bit of practice, you can line up the outer point, uh, the two outer points and get your diameter. And that, that weighs nothing. Or if you want to be a little more accurate, you can either use a circumference tape or you can simply wrap a string and then measure your string to get the exact diameter of the tree uh, uh, plotted from the circumference. But an estimate is plenty good. Main point is don't overestimate. That's, uh, that's common. In the comments section, I always add a few things like elevation. I check the elevation of the trees. That's helpful for our scientists and for us to know where is it growing. Right. I'll add the aspect of the tree. In other words, what's, what direction is the slope facing? northeast, south, southwest, whatever that is. Then I'll put what are the adjacent species. In this case, there's a dead red maple here, uh, some big leaf magnolias, etc. Generally in the gorge and um, uh, 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 Berea College, for example, you're, you're going to tend to find them growing with uh, mountain laurel, uh, big leaf, what I call big leaf rhododendron, or big laurel, um, and chestnut oaks and sourwoods. Also, blueberries are very common. If you find those species, you're going to find American chestnuts, I promise. Uh, so I always enter those kind of comments, and I also enter how much sunlight does the tree have. It's just an estimate. In this case, I would probably put this tree, including the side light, has about 90% sunlight, which is what allowed this tree to flower these past three years. And again, we've collected pollen the past three years. Now, here's the most important point of all. <laughs> I learned this the hard way. Uh, that is, once you enter your snap, be sure that you have to get done on that. Be sure that you hit this little button down at the bottom that says save. <laughs> be sure you do that. Or guess what happens? It doesn't save. So that's pretty much the process out of tree snap. Then again, the cool part is, as we kind of said earlier, once you have entered several data points, your tree snap gets more interesting because now you can go back and look zoom in and zoom out where was I what part of the contour ridge was I on where can I go next there were chestnuts in the area right here we suspected it we walked over here and the first thing I saw was probably a chestnut oak and that's and that's a that's a good indicator species because many of those areas that were once dominated by the American chestnuts now have a lot of red oak and chestnut oak and I looked and down here at foot level was an American chestnut. And then I'd start looking up and I saw two, two about eye level American chestnuts. And right here, I look up and here's, here's one that's, that's more than 30 foot tall. Thanks for joining me today and learning a little bit more about hunting for American chestnut and reporting those findings with the Tree Snap app. I hope you get out in your woods and hunt for some chestnut. Who knows, maybe the trees that you find will be part of a future that has more chestnut in it. If you have any questions, please reach out to us, get in touch with us online, or follow us on social media.